Welcome into ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and Tanitra coming up on today's show. Even though the Atlanta Hawks competed against the Celtics, they still don't need to rest on their laurels. Well, if you are in the bottom quarter of offense, I suppose the only place you can go is up. But exactly what is up for the Falcons? And last but not least, and for the culture, Snoop Dogg, he's out here making money moves. It's ATL Day Ones. Let's go. This is ATL Day Ones, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. I want to start by saying thank you for making ATL Day One your first listen of the day. And remember, we are free and available wherever you download your podcast and wherever you download your podcast. Make sure that you leave us a five star review. Really appreciate that from you in advance. Today's episode of ATL Day Ones is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more and visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. It's ATL Day Ones, your team every day. Now, T, when you think about the Atlanta Hawks and how they competed, you know, against the Boston Celtics, and I, I use that term lightly because I, I really appreciate how they competed, and I really appreciate what Quinn Snyder brought to the table. And and now, and when you look at how that series end up playing out, you understand why the Hawks had a sense of urgency in bringing him in. And but for me, T, it, I get concerned when there is a constant mentioning of that, and I'm thinking that they might look bit, look a little bit too much into it and say, you know what? we might be good or we might need to continue and try to build this thing out and see what it looks like with Quinn Snyder as the head coach and not make too many changes. What say you? I think they're going to be more aggressive. I think, I hope that the Hawks organization has learned a lesson from the last couple of off seasons and understanding that two years ago, the Hawks thought they had arrived, honestly, yeah, after the Eastern did. Conference Finals. And how do yeah. we know in making that trip you look at what they did in the offseason, it was virtually nothing. And yep. then they took it a little bit of a step further in getting DeJounte Murray. Good look, but just we I'll be honest, even then I never thought one piece was enough. I just yep. never did. I knew it would help, but I didn't think it was enough. And here we are. So I do think that Quinn Snyder, one of the things that he'll assess is what's the definition of compete? Because we're talking about someone who always competed at the highest level for the eight years that he was with the Jazz. He had those guys in like truly in competition, truly in contention for a title every single year, especially, and they just kept trending up. If you look at their stats, everything just improved exponentially. But a lot of that was they weren't afraid to make moves. So I yeah. do think that part of the reason that Quinn Snyder came to the Hawks was because he'd not only be coaching on the sidelines, but he'd be able to sit in the boardroom and help to make decisions when it comes to his personnel on the court. So, yeah, I, I don't think that just because they keep saying they competed, that that's going to mean they're complacent and they're going to accept what they have right now. And I and I think that, you know, Quinn Snyder is going to be uh, ahead of that. And I and and I, I really appreciate that because there's a new set of eyes. Right. And even though Landry Fields was here before, I, I feel like Quinn Snyder is a new set of eyes. He had a chance to get that 21 game sample size in the regular season. You know, to say, hey, let me put my hands on the guys. Let me talk to them. Let me touch on them. Let me see what's going on with them. Let me see if I can dig into their minds and see if we can make some adjustments to, to try to make a run or, or at least and compete like they did against the Boston Celtics. But I'm glad you brought up DeJounte Murray because I thought it was very interesting that he posted on Instagram about how he was at the Hawks facility working out. And from my understanding, T, you no, know, DeJounte is uh, going into the last year of his contract. And when you think about what that means and what they gave up for him, I would assume that they're going to, he, that he's going to be around. But does this say to you that, hey, this guy is locked in, whether he has a contract of, of extension um, already worked out or not? Yeah, I, I that is exactly what I thought. Like, okay. I'm here for the locked in. I'm here for the late nights in, in uh, Druid yeah. Hills. I'm all for it because I believe that the other thing is this. DeJounte Murray is a competitor at the end of the day. And right. game six was just not a DJ kind of game. And I can see him being that person who literally will go in the lab until he can get that taste out of his mouth 
of what it felt like, number one, not to compete at the highest level, especially when you had all that commentary in the video about how you were being wronged and being suspended in game five. So everybody expected you to come back in game six and have a monster game and maybe even help the Hawks to take it to game seven. Didn't happen. I would suspect that a person like him would say, okay, fine. You know what? I didn't show up with my A game for that game, but I'm going to show up for my A game for the entire season. And he knows that or probably knows that he is maybe about as close to untouchable as you get outside of being named Trey Young. Right. But he also knows that things can change because remember when the off season started for the San Antonio Spurs, a trade for him was not on the table. They came to him after the season ended a little ways in and said, Hey, we think we're going to go ahead and do a full rebuild. Would you like to transition and move on? So he knows what it looks like to one minute, in the off season, think that you're preparing for the next season with that team. And then the next minute you're on to the next one. So I believe that he's making his own statement to say, yeah, I want to be here and I want to be a part of what we can do next year. Yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, when you have the general manager out here making certain comments like these, when they hear about you, you know, uh, posting about working out of the facility, I think Landry Fields kind of put it at best when he said it. He was in here late. It's the culture that we're trying to create. You know, we need guys to work. We need you guys to understand that it's hard. Getting the championship here in Atlanta is not going to be easy. And it showcases for anybody who's coming to this organization, like, this is what we're about. I wasn't shocked when I saw it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's DeJounte Murray for everyone. And to be honest with you, T, they need more guys like DeJounte. They don't need to get rid of guys like DeJounte. <laughs> yeah, you do. And and Landry Fields was dead on with that spot on. Yeah, there are other guys that I'm sure are cooking in the lab when they don't have to be. But again, DeJounte Murray is your de facto leader of the team. We know that Trey may be your superstar. He may be the guy for the team. But the true leader, the guy that was out there like the floor general throughout this season, especially as he got more comfortable in his role, it was DJ. So yeah. I also believe that that's a lead by example situation that Landry Fields is all here for. And he understands as well, like we've got to do everything similar to the Boston Celtics. This was the same thing that we heard about when they lost last year to the Warriors. They were literally back in the gym almost the next day because they did not want to have that happen to them again this season so yeah i believe that landry fields he's like yeah i see you dj and i hope the other the others on this roster i'm looking for you all what, what are you doing in the all season because i think that yes the body of work that each one of them put forth in the regular season is definitely going to count the play in the postseason as well but little things like what you do between now and when the decisions are made for free agency i believe they make a difference too Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes a difference. And I, I think like with DeJounte and him making it, being out there and being an example and leading by example, you know, he even talked about how he's going to work with Jalen Johnson here in the offseason. And, and when you think about that aspect of it, that's the type of mindset that, or, or mentality that Jalen needs to have uh, to attack the game with, because we know we've seen glimpses from him, but we haven't seen it consistent, consistently. And I think that working with a guy like DeJounte, I think it's going to help him get there. Um, if faster than what he he probably would have done on his own so and that's a great going. point covering yeah. the skyhawks the last couple of seasons that was the feedback for Jalen. like the work ethic just got better and better over time and that's why he was able to right. last season start coming up more often and getting minutes a few more minutes this season and of course just exploded it feels like with quinn snyder at the helm so yeah i believe that Jalen johnson is open to that and if dj is going to take him under his wing i agree with you you can't have a better guy him coupled with of course what kyle corver is doing to help the likes of jj and onyeka okongu to develop more of their outside game their offensive game if you will and we've seen some shades of how that's been successful too so yeah if everybody can just step up their game just one more step i believe that yeah they're, they're making the case to say hey i want to be a part of whatever you guys are building next season absolutely and real quick t um you know the Braves, they were able to get the dub against the uh, the uh, New York Mets yeah, in them. the first in the first. Yo, know, those you didn't want to mention the yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Against the um, against the New York Mets nine eight in the first game, and then but in the second game, T, they end up losing five to three. The first at bat, Ronald Cunha gets plunked on the back of the back shoulder by Tyler McGill. 
Taylor McGill, Tyler McGill, whatever the hell his name is. And I, you know what, T? I just looking at the guy at, on the mound after after it happened. It would seem like it was almost kind of like he had like a little smirky jerk face on, on a look on his face. And then I was thinking like, even though he might not have intentionally done it, it just seems like this has been happening too much. And I feel like the Braves not doing anything about it is the reason why people, it continues to get done. Yeah. Now, what I think needs to happen, I believe last night was probably the appropriate time to just fall back and just kind of see, okay, because you know you're about to have it happen again with the Marlins in all likelihood. That's, I mean, that's where it happens the most, right? Yeah. But yeah. That that one was, Don Mattingly, Mother yeah. Blanca. I'm sorry. Right. That one was like really <laughs> egregious last night. I mean, yeah. when he went down, it, it, it looked like, oh no, not another setback for this guy who was just come out of the gates blazing <laughs> this season. Yeah. And so to me, it was just so very scary in that regard. But yeah, like you said, watching the replays, hearing people talk about it, looking at it over and over again myself, I'm like, say what you want to. But that looked really intentional to me. And I get it. Oh, two counting. You're thinking to yourself, hey, I'm about to strike him out or whatever. But the bottom line is this. I feel like that was a message that they're sending that the Braves are going to have to send come June. So, yeah, I'm okay with the fact that they fell back last night, maybe wanted to be a little bit conservative. But when the Mets come here in June, oh, I need you to set, I need you to set the table on those, that guy, the, that team. Those. Uh, as soon I said, as they those literally. mofos. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, top of the first, let's make something happen on them. Absolutely. I, I really wholeheartedly hope they, because at the end of the day, when you talk about these old school managers and Buck Showalter and everything with the Mets and Don Mattingly and all of those guys, like you have to kind of retaliate old school way. Like, yeah. hey, if you're going to be old school, I'm going to be old school too, because we're going to let you know that, hey, we're going to let our guys be themselves. And that's what Ronald Cunha was doing in that first game. He was being himself. And yeah. I have no issue with anything that he was doing. Yeah. Um, from a, from a running around the bases and doing his thing. That's what he does. Like, it's yeah. not personal. That's what he does. Don't let him hit a home run if you don't want him to do it. So, but yeah, hopefully they can start to get a little get back. Um, not necessarily right then and there because right. you know, I've it's done some things like that. Yeah. 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 Ask yeah. Don Mattingly. He'll yes, tell you. Ab absolutely. We know what time it is when it comes to that. Now, speaking of knowing what time it is, how about this? How about you want to win some money? We need you to go to fanduel.com slash locked on because it is the number one sports book in America. You know, you guys, we've been telling you about what's going on with the NBA playoffs and the NBA season. Now you can go to check out what's going on with the Major League Baseball. I'm talking about from Aaron Judge out here, how many home runs he going to hit, you know, and a pitcher can then go over on the strikeouts or over on under the strikeouts you want to win some money with. Our guy, Spencer Strider, you know, he struggled a little bit, but he still got eight strikeouts. So, yeah, go ahead and check out, you know, FanDuel.com because guess what they have for new customers? You can step up to the plate with a no sweat first bet up to one thousand um, dollars. That's a uh, bonus bet, a thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. So go to fanduelcom slash locked on to sign up to place your first bet to get up to one thousand dollars back and bonus bet. So don't miss your chance to go get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars when you join FanDuel today. Just go to fanduelcom slash locked on. That's fanduelcom slash locked on. FanDuel official partner of Major League Baseball. And if your bet was on the Falcons going offense for a third year in a row, you won the bet because <laughs> yes, yes, top 10 picks three years, <laughs> offensive picks three years. Kyle Pitts, Drake London, and of course, Bajan Robinson this season. So that's a lot of kind of stacking the deck, if you will, to give Desmond Ritter as many weapons as he could possibly have, right? Which is yep. great except we were also thinking, hmm, you got to get some guys in the trenches that can kind of make sure that they shore things up, run protection and pass protection. But okay, I think we've potentially got that because that left guard situation might just be solved with Matt Bergeron. But also you look at the numbers collectively, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we do know that from a run perspective, Falcons were top three in the NFL. But they drop off a whole heck of a lot when you put together the entire offense, 24 to be exact, out of 32 teams. So that said, and all of the things that they've done, and of course, we're only talking about the draft picks here because 
we're still kind of reacting to that. But of course, we know that they went out and got some offensive weapons in free agency as well. What then, with all of that stacking of the deck, should the expe- expectations be now for this Falcons offense? 25, 30 points a game. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's where I am, T, because when you're talking about a fourth overall pick in Kyle Pitts, eighth overall pick in Drake London, eighth overall pick in B. John Robinson. Those are dynamic players. Those are guys where we've deemed what unicorns, how Chuck Reed want to uh, refer to them as, guys that are versatile. They can You line them up anywhere. You can come up with all these different schemes and line them up on your positionless football. I even heard Terry Fontenot use that term. I was like, oh, here we go. He got a new term. He got to start right. rolling with. I was like, all right, yeah. T, TF, I see you. Basketball, <laughs> I, man. I was, like, I was like, all right, okay, we're playing basketball out here. Like, got the basketball team. The basketball theme keeps rolling. Okay, I feel you. I get it. But for me, like my expectations have to go up because when like they're an injury away to you, even though people talk about, oh, they stacked the deck on defense, but they are a couple injuries away from being right where they were last year. Because think about it. You got a guy in Calais Campbell who's going to turn 38 years old. You got a guy in Eddie Goldman who hadn't played football in a year. I hear people throwing his name out there. I was like, all right. Remember, he hasn't played football in a year. And there ain't no guarantee that he's going to make the team. Then you got Taquan Garam coming off an injury. That's at the defensive end, Scott. You got a Bud Dupree who has been inconsistent throughout his career. That's why he's Richie on this Grant third NFL team. Injuries. And yeah. Richie Grant with his injuries. And not knowing where necessarily where he's going to be. So all of these things – kind of pile up to say, you know what? That, that There's a possibility that we might be in the same place we are on defense. So guess what I'm going to do now? I'm going to where all the draft capital is going. I'm following, I'm following the money because eventually you're going to have to pay these folks. I know that's uh, sometime down the road, but these guys got to pay right now. So I, I think that my expectations for the Falcons in, in 2023 – is T, they got to score 25 points. Because if you look at the, look, the scoring leaders in the NFL last year, I think with the top six out of the top six teams, there were there was only one team that didn't make the playoffs. And I think that was the um, – it was only one thing that didn't make the playoffs. So when you and all of those teams were at 25 points or more. So that's yes. my bottom line right there. They have to score 25 points uh, at least if they want to comp- win a division and get into this playoff, playoff scene. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you could literally, literally look down the the list of those top offenses. You said Chiefs, Eagles, even the Lions kind of snuck in. But anyway, Bills. Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they were in the conversation for the division, you know. There it yeah. is. But they yep. were in the conversation for the division. And you're right. It all goes back to that high-powered offense. But here's how I look at it. And I was having this conversation kind of offline uh, with a couple of my buddies. And I was saying, you know, outside of Bajan, right? We, we all know what the expectation is for him, almost to the level of boom or bust because of the things that you just mentioned. But I start looking at what the potential is for the other rookies in this class mm. and who mm. has to really step up and have a big, Im- big impact in this rookie class in year one. Now, if you want the Falcons to get out of sort of the dungeon of offense across the entire league, the way you're going to do that is for a Matt Bergeron to step up and Ooh, immediately yes. step in and take over at left guard and have an impact and help this offensive line. We know they're good in the trenches. Yeah. They were solid. And as we've always given Caleb McGarry a whole lot of credit for his run protection. Now it's time to show that you've got the guns in place to be able to pass protect the way that we get on every down, no matter what. I don't care if it is run or pass, you're still going to get the same output, the same output, the same output from Chris Lindstrom. But for me, it's Matt Bergeron because I do believe that offensive line is going to have to show up big time in order for you to not only take advantage of the weapons like Drake London, who are in place in Kyle Pitts, but if you talk about the versatility of Bijan Robinson and being able to line him up anywhere on the field as well in the passing game, Bergeron's going to have to do some work. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's when you think about the the rookie that probably has the most pressure because uh, let's let's keep it real, let's keep it yeah. funky. You know how we do on this show, Bijan. Like all he has to do is just be a piece, and, you know, just a piece to come in and, and to be productive whenever day he does get the rock. Because you know Tyler Algier, I'm sure you know probably we at least start off as. You know, at the start for the team, and then yeah. Bijan, they'll work Bijan in um, at, 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 as they go along and figure out what they want to do with him. But when 
you talking about Bergeron being a guy who who was a left tackle in, yeah. in college and you know moving down inside and, and to mm -hmm. a guard spot and I really think he can make that transition because I got a chance to watch some film on him I think he's going to be a guy that can be able to do it I think he's strong enough I think he's solid enough for, um you know from a weight standpoint and he got some good feet and I think he'll be able to work it out but and that's that's going to be the key cog right there because you want to be able to continue to run the run game and you want to be solid in that pass pro because we know when there was the, some leakage last year, we know where it came from. It came from the guy that you just mentioned, mentioned in Kayla McGarry when they had to throw the football, and it came from that left guard spot as well, Andrew Dalman too. So yeah. he's going to have to uh, upgrade as well. So I, I think that how quickly um, Bergeron is able to make that transition from tackle to guard, from the college, making a leap from college to the NFL, is going to determine whether or not the, the Falcons be able to sustain themselves in the run game and try to improve um, throwing the ball as well as when they have to. Yeah, and speaking of weapons, this is a year that we're going to expect a big impact, borderline breakout season for Kyle Pitts because yeah. we saw – a lot of what we needed to see in his rookie year, but then there's that little injury at the end of the year. And then we had an injury again last year. That MCL was torn, right? So there was some video that came out m Monday from the Falcons facility out in Flowery Branch that saw him hobbling a little bit, right? There's a bit of a limp there. Now, we understand it's only early May. So he is still recovering, probably not yet at 100%. But does that concern you? at all that that might impact his ability to be available week one? Ooh, I'm glad you put it that way in week one because I don't think that he will be a full participant in training camp just off of just thinking, just doing from a number standpoint, right? Because you think about, you know, he got hurt. Well, they put him on IR on November the 21st. Um, so you're talking about December, January, February, March, and here we are, April, and then we're in the May. That's what, five months. So you're talking about at least six months from a recovery yeah. standpoint. Then you start to go into the rehab exactly. piece and being able to try to run and get back functional and run, running routes and all that stuff and, and being able to break your points. And then you got the mental aspect of it too, right? Yeah. Okay, that I, might be do I biggest. trust my knee? Yeah. Do I trust my, my, my lower body extremities mm -hmm. now that I'm coming off of this injury? So all of those things come into play where I say, I don't think he'll be a full participant in – in the uh in, in, in training camp but i do however i do feel that he may be ready to go within the first month of that uh, of the of the season and when you talk about missing the, maybe a couple games versus half the season or to a full season i mean that's, i don't get concerned too much but yeah it's i'm not surprised that you know that's kind of where he is right now at this point and you have two other key points there one is you do have johnu smith You've got Parker Hesse, so you've got some backup. That That's might, why it makes sense. That's why the <laughs> room is yes. as strong as it's been. That's number one. And number two, we're about a week away from getting the full complimentary schedule to know exactly who the Falcons play and where yeah. they're going to be home and when they're going to be away. So that could be critical as well. What do those first two, three, four games look like? Are they against opponents that are going to be expected to score a lot and then you have to kind of keep up with that? Or are they going to be opponents where it's like, okay, we've got enough weapons to be able to get through these first couple of weeks and not rush KP back. So we'll continue to kind of monitor that situation. But I agree with you. I think that he is probably on pace, maybe not ahead of pace, but on pace with where he should be with a torn MCL that took him out and put him on IR last November. So every day, we're sure you have something to say as well. We are sure that above and beyond Bijan Robinson, you guys have a rookie whom you think will impact this team the most let us know. Drop us a comment on YouTube. You can even, of course, follow us on Twitter. There are our Twitter addresses and drop us some comments. And you never know. If you guys make a strong enough case for something, we will bring it up in this show. And we'll definitely give you credit for dropping that knowledge on us. So thank you again for checking us out on YouTube, as always. And wherever you download your podcast, that's where you can find ATL Day Ones as well. So don't forget, once you check us out, might as well tell a friend to check us out, too. But T, this is for the culture. It is the intersection between sports, entertainment, the culture, and sometimes whatever the hell we want to talk about because that's just how we get down on this show. Today is no different. When you think about Snoop Dogg, T, as far as, like, I just get a picture in my mind that just popped out right now of the the the, the album cover where it was a tape back then for those you young folks. You know, look it up. Yeah, there was 
actually it tapes before you can just download on your phone and all that stuff but I ain't gonna get into that but uh and I think about the doggy style cover and I was just like man this man has evolved so much T <laughs> to the point now where he has joined uh a gentleman a brother by the name of uh Mr. Nico Sparks in the process of trying to buy the purchase excuse me the Ottawa Senators Senators T and it reportedly is going to be up to one billion dollars and may exceed that how about that Snoop is jumping into the all team ownership now he started his lead back in the back back in the day you know about you know getting opportunities for uh for uh for black youth so, you know to be able to play um um youth football and everything starting his own Snoop Snoop League it looks like he's trying to do the same thing as far as um getting um black folk interested in playing hockey so yeah how about yeah. that I really like it and you know it's good to evolve because you look at LeBron James for example part owner of Liverpool FC and that was a boss yeah. move that was a boss move because that particular soccer league is one of the premier leagues in Absolutely. the entire world so the money that we think about that's more like sometimes U.S. based money that's soccer money, that real football money, that's some yeah. real dough, right? Real Same money. thing yeah. when you look at hockey in Canada. Hockey is king in Canada. So if he purchases, if he's able to purchase the Senators with partners, and if he keeps it in Ottawa, maybe he intends to bring it to the U.S., but the smart bet might be to keep it in Ottawa because oh, yeah. that's where the money is when it comes to hockey. That's where the fan base is. That's where the love of the game is. But I agree with you as well. I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to move the team back into the U.S. Hey, Atlanta needs a team, Snoop, and you probably have like a part-time residence here. So if you want to drop that sure, Ottawa yeah. team into the city, we'd appreciate like it. it. Yeah. We miss it. hockey. But – I think that is such a boss move. And I think the versatility of it speaks volumes to young kids who are looking like, hey, you know, I want to be able to play football or I want to be able to rap. Or I want to be able to do these other things. All of that is great. But look at the blueprint that a LeBron James, a Snoop Dogg, et cetera, are creating to say, I'm starting to evolve myself because at some point, I mean, Snoop, his last album was a gospel album, but. Yeah. We may not ever see a Which rap good, album from Snoop yes. again, other than really greatest hits. So yeah. you have to start thinking about what the world, the next world is. And, and listen, he's always so creative with his collabos because this dude collab with Martha Stewart and everybody laughed. And we all know that the two of them are laughing straight to the bank. Yeah. Um, I, I can't disagree with anything you just said because like Snoop is a guy I, that I really, really it's, it's 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 amazing. I can't. It's hard for me to fathom him evolving to where he is, and and I think that that's why you partly why you do it, right? Because we we know sometimes we get locked in on people and like and look at them a certain way, and that's who they are, and that's who they're gonna continue to be. Oh, that's doggy style Snoop. No, that's not doggy style Snoop. That's doggone Snoop who's put out the gospel album. That's Snoop who's doggone who is on every doggone commercial that you can think of. He's uh, getting it on the level damn near Shaq T at this point when it comes to you know business endeavors. So yeah. for him to be able to to kind of move into this world, move into this realm, uh, another level of entrepreneurship, or just being able to say, hey, I'm an owner of an of a professional league team that's part of the bit four uh in, in the united states here or in canada as well so i i, I think it's really good for him uh to be able to to, to step into this world T. before we get out of here and i didn't and i didn't tell you that i was going to bring this up i want to bring this up because when i came across this story like it, it really really just kind of touched my heart um shaq barry um the defensive end outside linebacker uh, for um the tampa bay buccaneers lost his daughter two years old um, she drowned in the pool, and I just it, it that I I just couldn't imagine T, uh, you know that that happened to one of my daughters, but to see something like that happen, and because you know it was at a pool, I'm sure everybody was out there and kind of handling that thing, but just to just just I want to just give a heartfelt, a real heartfelt prayers. To the family, to the Barrett family, because I just couldn't imagine that ha that happening or that being a, being presented with that that type of situation. Yeah, indeed, prayers out to that entire family, thoughts with them, and just know that there's support out there for you. Because I mean, I can't imagine, but I will tell you that 
the Bucks organization, that's one of the ones you would want to be with if this mm-hmm. kind of thing happens, because yeah. by far they really do take care of their players. When I was able to cover them, I saw nothing but positive things out of that organization. So I would say that I feel like that organization is definitely going to wrap their arms around him and make sure that he and his family have the support that they need. But yeah, definitely thoughts and prayers. What a heartbreaking scenario for him. And we think we definitely want to thank you guys for wrapping your hearts around ATL day ones and making sure that you make us your first listener of the day. And remember, and all the people that come and check us out each and every day, you are everydayers. We appreciate you uh, from commenting and downloading our podcast wherever it's available. And wherever you download your podcast, you can get it. That's where we're right there waiting for you, Locked On Sports at Atlanta. And before you get out of here, guys, I want to tell you to make sure, make sure, make sure, because you never know when it could be your last, that you share love, show love, and most importantly, Spread love.